It is June 19th, 2024, and Russian President Putin just wrapped up a trip to North Korea. That's his first state visit there in 24 years. And when you look at the ties between Russia and North Korea, you look at the new treaty, the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement that they just signed, it's a reminder that these two countries have a lot of history from decades ago, and they are now coming back together as they are just two of the countries that have been targeted by the West. And to say that the West is not happy about this increased partnership is an understatement. But as Putin then goes on to his next visit this week, which is actually in Vietnam, it serves as another reminder that the West is not able to control the Russian president, although they have tried very hard to do so. We took a look at the current tensions, what's at stake, and where things are going earlier with a special guest. So let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is KJ No, a journalist, political analyst, and teacher specializing in the geopolitics of the Asia-Pacific region. KJ, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Pleasure to be with you, Rachel. Now, I want to get your take on the latest here. I know that Russian President Putin is on his first state visit to North Korea in 24 years. While there, he's meeting with the country's leader, Kim Jong-un, and we're seeing them meeting not just for talks, but they've also been seen taking a walk in the park and going for a drive with Putin behind the wheel of the car. How do you see the significance of this visit by the Russian president? I think it's tremendous. I really think it is a tectonic shift uh, geopolitically, geostrategically. I want to point out that when they met, uh, Kim Jong-un brought out his entire cabinet to the airport tarmac at 1 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, that's hospitality for you. Um, You know, uh, and then you could see them exchanging jokes and, you know, uh, President Putin hugged Kim Jong-un after the translator uh, translated a joke. So, you know, clearly a great uh, uh, interpersonal connection, but also strategically, geostrategically, politically economy. There's some foundational shifts that have been signaled uh, through this meeting. And among them, I think this is the thing that everybody is commenting on is that uh, the treaty, the comprehensive strategic agreement that they signed, includes provisions for mutual military assistance in the event of aggression against one of its parties. In other words, they're going back to the 1961 Treaty of Mutual Aid that North Korea had with uh, the USSR. I'm, I'm quite sure, the actual language hasn't been revealed, but I'm quite sure that it is very similar to the 1961 uh, mutual defense treaty that they had. And that is uh, really a game changer. Yeah, and it's really interesting to me. I guess that also speaks to kind of the timing of this, because as you mentioned, they've got this new treaty on comprehensive strategic partnership. The Kremlin described it as showing the desire of Russia and North Korea to boost relations in all areas. But is this really about military at the end of the day? And is this kind of about giving a signal to the West of, hey, not only are we two countries that get along, but we are two countries that would defend one another in the event of a wider conflict? Yeah, I think it's that. It's it's two things. One is that we will defend each other in the case of a wider conflict, and we also are working together to bring out a multipolar world. They mentioned this explicitly, that they're working for uh, a pluripolar world uh, that is free of uh, US uh, domination and interference. And this is making uh, the deep state minions in Washington soil their underwear right now. I mean, they're saying that this looks like a blood alliance Uh, This is an unholy union, according to Victor Cha, who's one of these minions. Uh, They're very, very upset. And it's like, maybe, did they not see this coming? It was very clear that this was coming. When South Korea started, uh, you know, sending hundreds of thousands of shells uh, to Ukraine, uh, you know, through the United States, uh, you know, Russia was sure to react, you know, very strongly for this. And... To understand this fully, you have to understand a little bit about the history 
of North Korea and Russia. Remember, you know, World War II was won when the USSR tore the guts out of the Nazis on the Eastern Front. Most people know this, but they also won in Northeast Asia in Manchuria. They went through like a hot knife through butter through the Kwantung army, which is Japan's most powerful, most deadly, most aggressive army. And when the Kwantung army was defeated, World War II was over. The Jap Japanese were defeated as a military power. Now, before Putin went to Pyongyang, he specifically mentioned North Korea and Russia fighting together in Manchuria against the Kwantung army. So it really is this kind of rekindling of this old, you know, uh, military and, you know, uh, political alliance that is very, very deep traditions and, you know, is really kind of uh, written in blood. And I think that uh, strength of that relationship, the strength of their allyship, uh, I think is just simply being reinforced. And that is shifting uh, the balance of power in Northeast Asia. Yeah, and I'm glad that you bring up the uh, history there between the two of them, because I, I think it's interesting. You know, you have these past ties between North Korea and the Soviet Union. You have obviously Putin's state visit to North Korea back in 2000. But then you have a little bit of a gap there. Do you see that gap and not necessarily in any sort of relations between the two, but is that because Russia was in a place of kind of trying to not necessarily go along with the West and their targeting of North Korea, but they didn't want to make too much of a fuss about it? Or is there more to it when it comes to how relations between Russia and North Korea have progressed through the 2000s and the 2010s? Well, I think you're right in that Russia was trying to balance, it was trying to accommodate the West. And one of the rules or, you know, the uh, the entry fee for, you know, being part of the Western alliance was to sanction North Korea. Russia was part of the sanctions regime against North Korea. What is important to note is Russia has essentially disabled that sanctions regime by uh, uh, refusing to renew the committee that is monitoring sanctions at the UN. So essentially, sanctions are over. They've made, they've, they've declared uh, that they're going to make, not in so many words, but it's clear that they're going to make North Korea sanctions proof. They're going to increase trade and economic ties. Last year, uh, uh, trade increased ninefold uh, in 2023 between uh, Russia and North Korea. Uh, and so, yes, there was a period when Russia was, you know, kind of, uh, it was not a good partner to North Korea. Uh, and that was the period from, I would say, uh, 1991 until the mid 2000s. But with this clear uh, aggressive posture of the United States and NATO towards Russia, uh, Russia is simply balancing back to its historical partnership with North Korea. Uh, and on the North Korean side, it's also important to note that uh, Yun Zagyal, because he has thrown his lot in completely with the United States, but also because he is becoming incredibly belligerent against North Korea. I think they see it as a necessi necess necessity. Both sides are benefiting. It is you know, a mutual aid pact. Uh, and it also reflects the historical moment. In 1961, that mutual uh, defense treaty, mutual aid treaty was signed because South Korea's Park Chung-hee was threatening North Korea with possible invasion. And uh, 2024, we see language from the South Korean president, Yoon so gyal which signals that there is imminent or potential uh, aggression. And so once again, uh, North Korea is balancing and, uh, you know, realigning with Russia on the most foundational uh, level possible. Uh, remember, you know, as I said before, they've been the strongest of allies for decades. Uh, literally, the USSR uh, was present at all junctures of uh, uh, North Korea's history in the liberation of Korea during the Korean War. Uh, there are vast elements of North Korean so society 
that are Soviet influenced and all the older, the higher cadre speak Russian, the science, technology, educational pedagogy, it's all Soviet. Uh, and so I think yeah. we're seeing uh, things go back uh, to that period. That's really interesting, especially to see how, you know, things that we were going through decades ago, now we've kind of come full circle in a way, not always for the best, but I know that that is a partnership that is being strengthened and that is for the best of those two countries, not necessarily for the best when it comes to the West. Speaking of the West and kind of the role that they are playing in all of this, I thought it was interesting in an article published by North Korean state media, Putin spoke very highly of Kim and the people of North Korea, and he promised to jointly resist illegitimate unilateral restrictions to develop trade and strengthen security across Eurasia. How much of this is being done kind of with the West in mind and also with you know South Korea in mind as well as you've been talking about and really just these threats where you have Russia and North Korea coming together and realizing, okay, we are facing threats coming from kind of the same direction. Yeah, I mean, clearly they see the need for mutual alliance because of the threats that are being posed by South Korea, by the United States, by NATO. So there really is that, you know, kind of mutual synergy of resistance. Uh, uh, this, there, there is this clear direction that they're pointing out that uh, there will be defense uh, and military technology that could be developed further. Uh, they believe that they have an unbiased and balanced stance on a peace settlement for Ukraine. So uh, clearly, North Korea is behind uh, Russia as far as uh, the uh, you know the uh, special military operation in Ukraine is concerned. And so, yes, I think it is really a challenge to the West in the sense of the you know the neoliberal um, colonial West. It really is this kind of a uh, strong statement that we are no longer going to uh, subjugate ourselves uh, to the whim and the will of the, the West and the U.S. hegemon. Yeah, now when it comes to how those military ties play a role in all of this, of course, the White House responded. They said that they are troubled by the deepening relationship between Russia and North Korea. The U.S. State Department said it was quite certain that Putin would be seeking arms to support the war in Ukraine. And, you know, it's so interesting when it comes to the West. On one hand, they act as though, oh, we need to be concerned about this growing partnership. And then on the other hand, they act as though, oh, Russia has to go to North Korea in order to get military support from them. Like they're struggling so much that that is the point that they're stooping down to. How do you see the actual realistic military ties between Russia and North Korea beyond just the propaganda that's out there in the West? Yeah, I think the the military ties, uh, military assistance uh, will really be in the domain of technology. Uh, I think that Russia is probably supporting uh, North Korea in the development of its ICBM, as Theodore Postel has pointed out. Uh, I think that they're uh, collaborating most likely on submarine technology. Uh, they're looking for a solid a nuclear deterrent. So that is, uh, I think that is definitely part of the picture. As far as this language that North Korea is sending shells and missiles, I don't think that is highly credible. I haven't seen any evidence that backs it up. Certainly there is some kind of support going on in many different dimensions, but I don't find the evidence around uh, shells and uh, missiles convincing for two reasons. One is if you talk about the shells, uh, the US and South Korea are claiming that North Korea is shipping shells in shipping containers. Now, if you know anything about a shipping container, it's designed to carry light items. It's not designed to carry heavy items like shells. So if you put a shell in there, it would be nine. If, if you put shells in there, it would be 90 percent empty. In other words, you know, instead of sending 20 pallets, you'd have to send 200 containers. And that's just a recipe for, you know, drawing attention and perhaps even interception. So that doesn't seem likely. The second is that uh, they have found one 
missile with fragments that an organization called CAR claims contains markings that look like they're from North Korea. Why are these markings from North Korea? Well, they say, you know, they use a certain, you know, pattern on a uh, uh, bolt pattern. That bolt pattern is universal. So it's not North Korea. So, you know, that's completely wrong. They say it contains the numbers 112. And they say 112 has a special significance in North Korean history. No, it's not. You know, they're just making stuff up. They say it has a Korean character on it, which is this character. Uh, and uh, they say this is Korean language, so it must be Korean. That's not true because uh, Korean never uses their language that way. It would be like finding an umlaut and saying, or accent circumflex and saying that proves something is German. You never use those things by themselves. You have to use them with other characters. And it could just as easily be the Japanese character su. So it could be Japanese, you know. So all this, you know, kind of evidence that they're putting forth uh, doesn't prove anything. It's it at this point, it just looks like a threat inflation and propaganda from my standpoint. Certainly the fact that it has a non-Russian uh, vein actuator doesn't mean that it's a North Korean vein actuator. So all of these things fall apart. So I don't think there's strong evidence for current munitions transfers as much as the West would like to assert that. But I think in the future and over the long term, there will be considerable technical and economic and uh, military technical exchange. I think that is certainly going to happen. This is why uh, they brought the head of the Russian Space Agency along to the meeting. Yeah, and that's likely what the West is probably, I would think, very concerned about, right? They're sitting there going, uh-oh, we don't want the technology transfers for them to collaborate on that level. Now, I did want to ask you about another visit that Putin has planned for this week following his trip to North Korea. He's now headed to Vietnam. And it's interesting to kind of see a little bit of the shift here as the as though it seems like there is a shift as you have representatives from the government in Hanoi who did not attend Zelensky's not peace summit in Switzerland last weekend, but Vietnam's deputy prime minister, or deputy foreign minister, excuse me, did attend a BRICS meeting in Russia last week. So what is the significance of Putin now going to Vietnam in person? Again, it's the consolidation of old allies. You know, the USSR was a strong ally of Vietnam uh, during the Vietnam War. What is happening currently in Vietnam is that it is purging its top government of the kind of American friendly capitalist uh, cabal that was uh, a kind of a faction inside its own government. You can see that they've cleaned out, they've cleaned house, they've gotten rid of the pro-American, pro-US uh, factions, and they're essentially casting their lot with China and Russia and the rising multipolar world. So once again, it's an affirmation of the strength of this rising political tide uh, and simply more consolidation of uh, existing blocs. Uh, if you will, uh, from the Chinese perspective, you know, if Russia is uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the safety, uh, then they are reinforcing their uh, linebackers and their, uh, you know, uh, corner. So. Yeah. And when it comes to this increased focus, I know you have the U.S. They certainly have their eye on China. We've talked about rising tensions there. But when it also comes to Russia's increasing focus, whether it be on North Korea, on Vietnam, as you were pointing out there, some of these past partners, does that kind of signal that we could see an increase in tensions, especially in the months to come, because you know that the U.S. is not happy about Russia's, what Russia is doing right now. They're not happy about the fact that you have increasing ties between Russia and China, and they're likely to act out and to, I guess, try to stop it or just try to increase tensions as we continue on on that road to World War III. Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I think you're right. I, I do think that this has the potential to uh, increase tensions even further, push things even further 
up the escalation ladder. What I see right now is China is trying to talk to Korea and Japan, remind them of you know the mutual benefits, the trade ties, and see if them talk them down into de-escalating rather than going up the escalation chain. But I think it's very possible we could see more escalation. Certainly, we see the language coming out of Washington from uh, you know Secretary Blinken and from, as I said, the deep state minions. You know they are very very unhappy about this. They're soiling their pants. They're saying you know for example Victor Cha as is being saying we need to put the screws on China right now and tell them to you know uh, put pressure on North Korea. You know this is not going to happen. They're not reading the tea leaves correctly, but certainly uh, there is a considerable potential. What it does in the short term is it blocks U.S. immediate escalation that we were seeing in uh, Taiwan, the South China Sea, and in particular in Northeast Asia, in Korea. It looked for a while that Korea was going to be the key flashpoint. And we saw this signal because there was an article, again, by another deep state minion, Carlin and Hecker. Uh, they wrote an article in 38 North saying that North Korea had run out of options and was going to attack South Korea. Now, that's ridiculous because North Korea has not run out of options. But they said that because North Korea is disengaged, now it's going to attack South Korea. Doesn't make any sense, right? But they said North Korea's run out of options. It only makes sense to assert that North Korea has run out of options if you assume that the, it is South Korea and the United States which is going to attack and North Korea has no option but to defend itself. And if you look at the war exercises that we're conducting, you know, 20 strategic nuclear bombing exercises, 200 days of nonstop military exercises and military exercises where they're actually rehearsing the taking of North Korean prisoners, that tells you how advanced, how escalated, you know, this uh, these preparations were. Uh, and so, you know, I think from that standpoint, uh, North Korea tying itself and reasserting its military uh, uh, relationship with Russia will, uh, cool, uh, you know, turn the heat down a little bit. But as you pointed out, I think this has the potential for further escalation uh, further down the road. And that is very, very worrisome. Yeah, certainly. A lot at stake here all around. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today to break down all of the latest. KJ No, a journalist, political analyst, and teacher specializing in the geopolitics of the Asia Pacific region. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you, Rachel. Always a pleasure. If anything in this video resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment. And as always, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevins.substack.com. If you want to support my work, you can also check out my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rachelblevins. That's where you can sign up as a monthly paid subscriber and join the community there. As always, thank you all so much for all of your support and I'll see you next time.